Tuesday, November 7th. We had our last home game today against Manatee Middle. They hadn't won a game all year, and they had been recently trounced 8 to nothing by Lake Windsor Middle. They looked terrified to be on the same field as the fearsome War Eagles. I got to start the game at left wing because Nita was out with the flu. At about two minutes into the game, Maya hooked a 30-yard shot right into the net. The goaltender never even moved. At five minutes into the game, she did it again, but this time the ball hit the right post and came bouncing back at chest level, right across the mouth of a goal. I dove at it and connected with my forehead, right above the glasses. I hit the ground and the ball sailed into the back of the net, a beautiful highlight, highlight real goal. Victor pulled me to my feet shouting, yeah, yeah, come on, let's get another. We lined up again quickly as we always do. The Manatee coach called timeout and came running onto the field to talk to the referee. We had to stand there and wait while the referee signaled Betty Bright to join them. It wasn't until then that I noticed the storm overhead. It had blown in quickly, darkening the field and lowering the temperature. A bolt of lightning shot down, the thunder following almost immediately. The coaches conference broke up and the Manatee guy waved his players off the field. They seemed eager to get away from us and back into their bus. Betty Bright called to us into called us into a circle. The coach says they can't play in any lightning. It's their school policy. Victor said, so they quit? That's the game? No. Right now it's a rain delay. Let's all get inside and try to keep loose. We ran into the building and congregated around the double doors in the back. The referee, a tall woman with short blonde hair, came in behind us just as the rain hit. Victor went up to her. Yo, ref, what's up with this? Are we going to have to play some kind of rain out game? The referee wrote something into a little notebook. She replied, nope, this is it. You play today or it goes down as no game in our book. What's that mean? It's like it didn't happen. Victor grabbed me by the shoulder and shook me dramatically. What about Fisherman's goal? The referee sounded sympathetic. It didn't happen. Not if we don't play at least half the game. Man, Victor pounded angrily on my back. We were going to murder these chumps. It was going to be like 50 to nothing. I was going I was going to up my numbers. Betty Bright kept looking out the window. She said it doesn't matter. We might play. If we don't, we're still undefeated. She pointed she paused to point at Victor and untied. And untied was a reference to Lake Windsor Middle School and what had happened to them yesterday. Up until yesterday, they had the same record as us. Then they took that bus ride to Palmetto Middle School, home of the Whippoorwills, and got stuck in a 0 to 0 tie. Maybe they couldn't handle the dirty play or the acorn throwers. We hung around near the back door, shuffling in our cleats for 20 min more minutes of pounding rain. Finally, Betty Bright called out, there they go. We crowded by the doors, and I could see the red taillights of the manatee bus receding in the rain. Victor turned to the referee. They quit, right? It's a forfeit? The, the referee shook her head. No, not under these circumstances. You could never have played in this weather. We play in any weather, lady. We're the War Eagles. The referee handed a piece of paper to Betty Bright. I guess that's up to you, but this is a no game today. All right, coach? Betty Bright nodded. She signaled for us to gather around. Nothing more we can do here today. Maya, Paul Fisher, good going with those goals, but they don't count, so we have to forget about them. Everybody get up to your classrooms and get changed with no horsing around. We have practice tomorrow, our last practice. We have a game on Friday, our last game. Victor interjected, Lake Windsor, home of that Geno chump. The coach replied, Lake Windsor, home of the only other undefeated team, but they couldn't put the ball in the goal yesterday. Yeah, they shut out that Geno fool. You forget about him, Victor, or you'll end up the fool. You concentrate on us putting the ball in the goal. If we get over there and lose our heads, lose our focus, we lose everything that we work for. But we can win it all too, right? That's right. Remember all of you. We have the better record. The title is ours to win. Like they say in the big leagues, we're in control of our own destiny. Wednesday, November 8th. I must have made an impression on Mr. Donnelly. We're all over the front page of today's Tangerine Time sports section. There was a long article about middle school soccer and a looking back feature at Betty Bright at the Pan American Games. First, the soccer article. It named the three top scorers in the county. Maya Pandy, of course, is number one with 22 goals. But check this out. Gino DeLuca and Victor Guzman are tied for number two with 18 goals apiece. The article goes on to point out that Maya herself has scored more goals than most of the teams in the county. The scoring total for Tangerine Middle School is an awesome 52 goals, which is already 10 above the previous record. The article didn't waste any space describing the records of the lesser teams in the county. There were only two records worth talking about. Tangerine is 9-0-0, Lake Windsor is 9-0-1. The article concluded, 
The championship will be decided at tomorrow's big game between the War Eagles and the Seagulls at the Lake Windsor Field. The feature on Betty Bright was more of a picture essay. It had a color snapshot of her in a tangerine high school uniform. It had a wide-angle photo of her posing with other members of the U.S. Olympic team, and it had a grainy black-and-white photo taken off a videotape, showing her in mid-stride, clearing a hurdle. Another hurdler's fist extends from the edge, from the left edge of the photo, right into her eye. Her face is twisted, punched to the other side. The caption below it says, a controversial non-call in Buenos Aires. After I finished reading the essay, I began to worry. Did Betty Bright mind the publicity? I thought about her meeting at the practice field with Mr. Donnelly and the photographer and Chandra Thomas's frightened run from the other camera. Did Betty Bright feel the same way? Did she mind this painful memory being plastered across the front page of the newspaper? Did she mind having to relive that punch in the eye? Friday, November 10th. Today's game, like all away games, began out of the circular driveway at Tangerine Middle. As usual, we gather around the bus with our cleats slung over our shoulders, waiting for the bus doors to open. What was unusual was the crowd. The people who turned out for our home games, parents, little brothers and sisters, and other locals, had turned out for this game too. When Betty Bright opened up the bus door and called out, Count them up, Victor! A caravan of at least 25 cars and trucks, including the green Ford pickup, fell into place behind us. Everyone was quiet, subdued, as we rolled out of the parking lot. Nita was back, sitting with Maya, although she didn't look too good. Neither did Chandra, who was sitting right behind them. She had her forehead pressed against the window and her eyes closed. Was she not feeling well? Was she lost in thought? It was hard to tell. As we drove past the packing plant and into downtown Tangerine, Henry D. started to tell me about last year's game with Lake Windsor. It came down to the last game last year, too. That's why they're out our arch enemy now. They came here last year with the same record as us, 9-1. They beat us in the last game on our field. Victor was listening. He called over. You tell him about that, Henry D. He raised his voice. Anybody else who doesn't remember needs to hear about this too. They stole our championship last year on our own field in our own backyard. They must die for that. I said, what was the score? Henry replied four to one. But then Victor picked up the story. Ignacio was last year's captain, Dolly's brother Ignacio. So Ignacio scored a goal in the first half and we were in control all the way. We must have had 20 shots on goal to their two. Here he stopped and looked around accusingly. But in the second half, we let down. We got overconfident. That Geno dude started doing things on his own. He'd get the ball at midfield and take it all the way into the goal. Nobody stopped him. He scored three goals in the second half, and that Chinese dude got one. I figured he was talking about Tommy Okoso, I said. He's Philippine. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. Whatever he is, he took the penalty kick after Ignacio finally flattened that Gino kid's butt. Victor's eyes narrowed as he recalled the moment. It was like a joke to him. I heard him tell that Chinese dude to take the kick because he was tired of scoring. Victor grew silent, reliving last year's game, getting angrier and angrier. We drove on, an old bus and 25 cars and trucks toward the developments, went out of town toward the developments where I live. It was strange, very strange. I was driving past the sites that made up my ride to and from school every day, but today I looked at them through the hostile eyes of a war eagle. Victor had chilled out some, and he started to comment on the scenery. He talked as if he had never been out this way before in his life. Check it out. It's like lifestyles of the rich and famous out there. Others started to get into it as we caravaned past the villas at Versailles. Check out that gate, man. What is that? That's gold. Look at that gold on that stuff. That's beautiful, man. That looks like a movie. They were all sincerely amazed at this stretch of road, this stretch that I took for granted. It was like a movie, like a movie set anyway, painted on plywood and propped up by a two-by-fours, as phony as Eric Fisher football hero smile. I watched it with them, amazed too, amazed that it could be out here, where once only citrus trees had been. I watched it all roll by until we pulled onto the landscape campus of Lank Windsor Middle School. I could see crowds of people as soon as we turned around the main building. People were ringing the soccer field. The crowd was two to three people deep on the home side and spilling over onto the visitor side. Betty Bright drove the bus onto the grass as the rest of our caravan veered off into the parking spaces. We bumped over the grass until we reached the corner kick area on the visitor side. That's where we parked. That's where we always park. The coach has made this name the same off-road trek at every away game, just in case we need to find shelter or make a quick getaway. I looked out over the crowd, searching for familiar faces. There were a lot of them. Mom was standing with some other adults along the home sideline. Did she realize that I was a visitor? Joey was near her. So were Kara and Carrie and a bunch of kids from my old classes, from my old life. Mr. Donnelly 
and the long-haired photographer were set up at midfield. Coach Walski, bald as ever, was out with his players on the field, leading them into calisthenics. They looked bigger than I remembered. Gino, Tommy, and all those 8th grade guys seemed to have grown taller and stockier. They looked like a football team. I pulled on my cleats and tied them tightly. Listen up, the coach called. Let me break it down for you. There are three things that we can do today. Win, lose, or tie. If we win, the county title is ours. If we tie, the county title is ours. If we lose, the county title is theirs. Betty Bright stood up all the way up to the ceiling of the bus. Let me tell you something else. You have outscored every team in the history of this county, and you are going to outscore this team today. Okay, Victor, lead them out. She threw open the bus door. Victor strode to the front of the bus and jumped out followed by his boys, and then the rest of us. We ran down the inside perimeter of the field. The crowd stared, but no one yelled or spit at us. Mom waved. Joey was busy looking the other way. Carrie was looking right at me. So was Mr. Donnelly, who gave me a big thumbs-up sign. We turned and ran toward the visitor sideline and heard the loud cheers of our caravan riders. At midfield, Victor turned sharply and sprinted toward the center of the field, as he had done so many times before. Betty Bright was already there. We packed around them and chanted our war cry. Who are we? War Eagles. Who are we? War Eagles. The coach's voice rose up angrily, letting us know that our response was not good enough yet. I said, who are we? We screamed back, war Eagles, and fell into the frenzied chant that began each game. War, 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 war. We broke the circle and the starting players took their positions. I looked around the field. All the people, the Lake Windsor players, the students, the adults were staring at us with their mouths hanging open. In amazement? In disapproval? In fear? The game began at that moment, in silence. I stood in the line with Betty Bright and the smaller substitutes, the kids who only got into the blowout games. I had never minded being a substitute on this team until that moment. Just about everyone I knew could see me standing there, not quite good enough to be out on the field. I hoped Betty Bright understood that this was the school I used to go to, this was the team I used to play on. I checked out that Lake Windsor goaltender. He was the same eighth grader who had named me Mars long ago, those many weeks ago. If things had been different, would I have been standing there in his place? Probably. Would I have made any difference? Probably not. They had won nine games without me, and they had played to one scoreless tie. This was a team that did not depend on its goaltender. The action on the field started slowly. Both teams were sloppy kicking the ball away. Victor seemed more intent on intimidating Gino than he was on getting the ball. Victor and Gino slid for the same ball near our sideline and got tangled up. The referee blew the whistle and called for a drop kick, but Victor still had one more thing to say. He got right up in Gino's face and started jawing. Suddenly, one of those big fullbacks they have, I don't even know his name, ran up and grabbed Victor by the hair. He spun him around and punched him, full in his face. Victor went down on a heap, hitting the back of his head on the ground. The referee lunged at the Lake Windsor player and grabbed him. He yelled to Coach Walski, out of the game! He's out of the game! Betty Bright took off toward Victor, and I was right behind her. She reached and grabbed Tino, who was closing in on the Lake Windsor fullback with murder in his eyes. She pulled him with her to the spot where Victor was lying. His eyes were open, but he had a dazed look. She said, Victor, can you understand me? He said to her, I'm okay. I'm ready to go. He was strangely calm, like he didn't know or remember what had just happened. He sat up quickly. Really, coach, I'm okay. I'm ready. Betty Bright said, no, I got to check you out on the sideline for a while. She called to the referee. Substitution. Then she turned to me. Paul Fisher, you're in. Victor struggled to get to his feet. She held on to him while she called the rest of us around her and said, this is where it happens. This is where losers act like losers and winners act like winners. This is where they send some fool out here to punch you in the face. If you retaliate, you're playing their game. If you get focused on soccer, you're playing your game. She walked Victor off the field and the action resumed. We had a free kick coming from the spot where the foul took place. The referee put the ball down and blew his whistle. The Lake Windsor players who had huddled together after the goal were slow getting back into positions. I saw this and screamed, go! I kicked the ball as hard as I ever have over the heads of the surprise defenders. Our front line took off and flew past them. Tino ran the ball down in the left corner, pivoted and crossed it with his right foot. Maya slapped it to the dead stop on the ground as a Lake Windsor fullback skidded past her. Then she powered into the back of the net. Bang! It happened that fast. That's how it had gone all season. That was our trademark. We struck swiftly with just a couple of passes and bang! Into the goal, one to nothing. 
The Lake Windsor team was in confusion. They were yelling, offsides, but it wasn't offsides. They'd been caught flat-footed. Their goaltender didn't have a chance. After that, Gino and Tommy took over. They started picking the ball up at midfield and either dribbling it themselves or passing it to each other. After they started shooting, Gino can drop the ball harder than anyone I have ever seen on a straight line from outside the penalty area. He grazed the top of the crossbar with one that Chandra didn't even get close to. He then made her dive to deflect one away from a corner kick. He and Tommy worked a series of short passes all the way into the penalty line. Tommy reared back to kick it, and Chandra charged out, sliding him into, into him for a block. But Tommy faked the kick, pulled the ball back, and flipped it over and flipped it over her into the open net, one to nothing. Chandra got up slowly, holding her stomach. The Lake Windsor players ran out to celebrate with Tommy. I watched Chandra stagger back to the goal. She looked feverish, weak. She held onto the goal post, bent over, and vomited a white liquid into the grass. I turned and saw Betty Bright hurrying toward her. At the same time, Caesar, our smallest substitute, came running onto the field. Victor had named him Caesar Salad. He only got in in absolute blowouts. He ran right up to me and yelled, Fisherman, coach says that I'm in for you, and you're in for Chandra. He handed me a red goalie shirt to wear. I pulled the shirt on and ran down to the goal just as the coach was leading. Chandra away. I placed my heels on the goal line and looked out. The Lake Windsor players had lined up in the distance, ready to come at us again. I thought, wait, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I was numb. I felt like throwing up too, but there was no time to think about it. Gino took the ball away from Henry D like he wasn't even there and came sprinting right up the middle of our defense. Dolly tried to slide into him, but he was too quick. He flicked the ball to the right, hurtled over her, and came at me one-on-one. -on -one. I was flat back on my heels when he fired the shot, a bad shot, right at me. I moved my arms to grab it, but they never came together. The ball bounced off my face, knocking my goggles up and knocking me back into the goal net. The ball bounced right back to Gino, who tapped it. It was two to one. Gino himself pulled me out of the netting. You all right, Mars? Yeah, you better get ready. Mars, I'm coming back. Yeah, yeah. His teammates mobbed him. Mine didn't even look at me. I took off my goggles and cleaned them. When I pulled them back on, they were smeared with blood. I looked down and saw a dark red spray of blood on the goalie shirt. My nose was bleeding. I bent over, pinched the bridge of my nose, and blew out as much blood as I could. I twisted the shirt around and cleaned my goggles again on the back of it. Dolly came over. Fisherman, you all right? I sure was. Yeah, I yelled, let's go. Now I felt it. I was into it now. They came right back at us. Gino ripped a long shot that I dove for and caught in midair. I leaped to my feet and kicked it away. For the rest of the half, I was awesome. I was zoned. I stopped everything they sent my way. I punched shots away. I deflected shots over the goalpost. I came out and slid into them before they could get shots off. The half ended like that, with a relentlessly Windsor assault that produced nothing. It was still two to one. We spent half time sitting in a semicircle by the far goal, eating our tangerines. Victor would be going back in for the second half. Nita, who was struggling, would not. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Coach Walski was standing next to me with his clipboard. He looked at Betty Bright and said, Coach, this goaltender of yours is not eligible to play. He wasn't eligible to play for me, and he's not el eligible to play for you. Betty Bright stood up and faced him. They were the same height. Oh, is that right? This is your official warning. I'm going to talk to the referee next. You are. So what makes him ineligible? His address, for one thing. Now we can talk this over at a hearing, if you like. I'm just here to tell you that the County Sports Commission won't recognize him as eligible, so you're going to forfeit the game if you put him back in. Is that how it is? Yes, I'm sorry, but that's how it is. Uh-huh. Did you see my other goaltender? Her mother had to drive her home because she's sick. Did you see her? She's Chandra Thomas. Coach Walski stared at her blankly as Betty Bright continued. Do you know where she lives, Coach? She lives in Tangerine with her mother and her brother. Do you know who her brother is? He's Antoine Thomas, your football star at the high school here. Anton Thomas lives in Tangerine, too. Now, are you sure you want to play that county eligibility game with me? Coach Walski took a step back. His face seemed to flatten out like she had just hit him with a shovel. He said, I'm sure Antoine Thomas has a different address. I'm sure he does, but he doesn't live there. I can take you and show you or any officials of any commission exactly where he lives. Coach Walski continued backing away. This time he didn't stop. All right. All right, let's just play ball. Betty Bright snorted in disgust. Yeah, let's all play ball. She jerked her thumb toward the field, and we all hopped up. She pointed an angry finger at me. Get in that goal, fisherman. The return of Victor in the second half made a huge difference. Lake Windsor could no longer double and triple team Maya. Victor took control of the middle of the field, which meant that we started to play the game 
up at their end instead of down at ours. Gino and Tommy still broke out with the ball and worked their plays, but I was always there. I saw each play as it developed. I thought one step ahead of them each. I saw each play as it developed. I thought one step ahead of them each time. Maya shouldn't shake couldn't shake the crowd of defenders around her inside the penalty box, so she started coming out to the wings. She made a neat move with the ball to get loose in the, cor in the corner. Then she crossed it, hard and low, right across the front of the goal. Tino and a Lake Windsor defender both lunged for it and smacked into each other. The ball squirted through everybody and landed right at the foot of the one guy nobody was worrying about, Caesar Salad. He was wide open. He stopped the ball calmly and kicked it into the net, <laughs> two to two. We lined back up quickly. The battle for the middle heated up. The Lake Windsor players started to get desperate, started to kick the ball away. We were playing with confidence and with the clock on our side. Tommy and Gino were now going all the way back into their own end of the field to pick up the ball. They had to. They weren't getting any help from anybody on their team. They were their team. The referee was already glancing at his watch when they made a final charge. Tommy picked up a loose ball at midfield and looked at Gino. He drove a long, high, looping pass into the penalty box that Gino and Victor... Both went up four. They collided and twisted midair. Victor crashed down on top of Gino right at the penalty line. The referee blew his whistle. No, I thought. No, you can't call that a penalty. Both coaches came running out on the field. Victor jumped up screaming, I played the ball, man. I was going for the ball. But it was too late. The referee grabbed the ball and placed it on the penalty line 12 yards in front of me. Coach Walski asked, how much time is left? The referee answered, this is it. He turned to Betty Bright. The penalty occurred right before the end of regulation. Yeah, sure it did, she snarled. She walked up to me. You ready for this? Yeah. What are you going to do? He always hits his penalty shots high and to the left. That's where I'll be. She nodded. Then she smiled, lowered her voice, and said, Now I wish I'd given you more playing time. The players from both teams lined up outside the penalty box, everyone except Gino and me. He looked at me, touched the ball with his foot, and stepped back three paces. The referee blew his whistle. Gino's head snapped up and he sprang forward one, two, three steps. I catapulted myself into the air, high and to his left. But Gino didn't kick it there. He had fooled me completely. He went the other way with it. I was a fool, flying through the air. I was a fool, landing on the ground. I closed my eyes and buried my head in my arms, trying to block out the whooping cheers. Then I snapped my head up. It was Victor's voice that was whooping. I turned and looked back at the goal. The ball was not in the net. It was off to the right and still rolling away down in the sinkhole. Gino had missed. He had missed to the right. The rest of the War Eagles mobbed me and hoisted me up. We all started to jump up and down and whoop together. I stopped and stepped out of the pack when Gino came over. He patted Victor on the back and said, congratulations. Then he put his arm around my shoulder and said, Mars, you were in my head on that shot. You made me miss. You made me choke. I shook my head vehemently. You didn't choke, Gino. You missed. That's all. He wasn't the least bit upset. It's cool. I don't mind. It's only a game, Mars. As he walked away, I was still shaking my head. I said out loud, but too low for him to hear. Maybe to you, it is. Spectators were out on the field now. Someone tapped my shoulder and said, good game, Paul. I knew that it was Carrie, but by the time I turned around, she was already walking away with Kara. Joey wasn't with them. Luis Cruz pounded me on the back and said, I didn't know you were a goalie. Great game. Great game. I said, thanks. I'm glad you think so. Then mom was standing in front of me. She said, are you okay? Yeah. Now what does this mean, Paul? Are both teams co-champions? No, we're the champions. We have the better record. We were 9-0-1. We're 9-0-1. They're 9 0 2. Oh, now do you want to ride home? No, I want to go back on the bus. That doesn't make sense, Paul. I'd have to follow the bus all the way over there and then drive you right back here. That's right, Mom. That's what you're going to have to do. She thought about it, then put her hands up in mock surrender. Okay, I give up. I worked my way back toward the bus, shaking hands with a couple more Lake Windsor players. Mr. Donnelly called out, come over here, Paul. He and his photographer had set up a shot with Caesar and Maya. It was comical. Maya towered two feet over Caesar. Come on, we need you to balance out this shot. I shook my head. No, sir, it shouldn't be me. It should be Victor. Then let's get Victor too. Where is he? Mr. Donnelly located Victor and posed the four of us for the front page of tomorrow's sports section. And when we all got back to the bus, the coach called out, How many, Victor? Fifteen, coach. Betty Bright closed the door and turned to us. She pointed at us and said, You're number one. You're second to none. Victor grabbed Caesar from behind and shook him. He declared, his name is Julius Caesar now, the emperor of Rome. We pulled out of Lake Windsor campus, whooping and yelling with our caravan of fans behind us. 
When we got to the downtown stretch of Tangerine, everybody in the row started honking horns and flashing lights. People came out of the shops along the main street, cars pulled over and stopped to see what all the commotion was about. I'll never forget that ride home. When we got to Tangerine Middle, the bus doors opened and the War Eagles got out to find their separate rides, to go their separate ways. I was the last to get off. I was crying when I finally climbed down the stairs with my shoes over my shoulder. I crossed over to the white Volvo. Mom looked at me funny. Maybe she was wondering why I was crying, but all she had to say was, well, that was quite a ride. I swallowed hard and managed to say, it sure was, Mom. It was quite a ride.